Uh, thank you, David, for setting up this discussion of Poteet uh, and Polanyi and uh, for uh, taking on the impossible task of summarizing succinctly Polanyi. This project that Phil Mullins and I have to present, and Phil has to go to a wedding in London, so he's unable to be with us, but uh, it's going to be a shift from the impressive, integrative, and sometimes abstract uh, discussions we've had so far of Bill's contributions, where we have seen him appear as a Cartesian challenging and congenial colleague, or a kind of a Niburian crypto-Quaker, or a kind of, <laughs> kind of a uh, consistent Kierkegaardian incarnational Christological theologian, or a prophet of radical embodiment swimming upstream in a sea of post-postmodernistic constructivism. <laughs> we're trying to recover, <laughs> we're trying to recover the ground uh, of the actual history of the relationship in the third quarter of the 20th century between these two highly innovative, remarkable uh, figures. And ha have any of you had a chance to, uh, just to give me some feedback about what I should do here, to, to read uh, what we have on the website, show of hands, some of you have seen that, great because uh, I really want to have time for your input because I think there are people in the room who can add, uh, add further uh, information. But let me, let me run through uh, the handout quickly and, and add a few things. Um, if you haven't had a chance to read those documents, I would encourage you to, to look at them, maybe skip what we have said, but there's some primary material we have gotten from correspondence, from interviews, there's some very interesting letters, I think, that Bill wrote at various points, uh, and uh, I, I think you will find them interesting. The bottom line for me first is that there was much more to this relationship between these two radical and innovative thinkers than Phil and I knew, and Phil knows, if you know Phil, Phil knows a lot about Polanyi. I think he was surprised about the depth of the interaction and relationship even though we knew they were important for one another when we started digging into it. Uh, Poteet was uh, Polanyi's ally, promoter, agent, probably his designated literary executor uh, in this period, and was highly enthusiastic about Polanyi's grand project, I'm calling it, uh, in this period, particularly between 64 and 68. And the second point of my bottom line is that there may have been a major shift, and we identify that in 68. Bill, of course, identifies it himself and calls it his Orphic dismemberment, and we're going to talk, I'm going to talk about that a little bit. Now, Bill discovers Polanyi in 1952. He's finished his dissertation. He reads this article uh, on the stability of beliefs. It's the incredible exchange between the Azandi uh, uh, witch doctor and uh, the scientific uh, agronomist. Uh, Ron Hall and I remember from CC16 this debate going on for at least two weeks. Uh, did any of the rest of you in, see Bill do this in, in classes, uh, role, role play this? Was that a one-time thing? I can't believe it. Uh, I came away thinking the Azandi was right. <laughs> So, uh, but anyway, that's the first, uh, first uh, exposure. Then in 54, there's the essay that has already been discussed this morning uh, on the second edition of, uh, of uh, Popper's uh, volume. And uh, Phil, whose knowledge of Polanyi's thought and changes in his terminology over the years is far above mine and most of ours, I suspect, is confident that that essay reflects Bill's familiarity with the logic of liberty, because the phrase that he used, he doesn't cite Polanyi, he just says he, there's this, this reference uh, to Polanyi, but no uh, citation. But it's certainly more than the stability of beliefs, probably the logic of liberty. Now, he could have read Science, Faith, and Society by then, we don't know. Uh, uh, but. Um, we ask, what is a philosophy professor doing, uh, spending time reading that uh, particular uh, book, which in a way is more a uh, political uh, tract? But um, 
um, Bill was teaching in the philosophy department, as uh, Dale mentioned this morning. But we have learned uh, from uh, Ed Yoder, and I have a note about that in your handout, uh, that uh, one of the courses he was teaching was philosophy and politics. He was also teaching a, uh, a course on philosophy in uh, literature. Um, Ed Yoder, by the way, uh, and I'll have some more uh, recollections of Bill as a teacher at UNC from Ed. Uh, Ed is a fascinating guy. He was editor of the Daily Tar Heel, uh, went on a Rhodes, then uh, won a Rhodes Scholar and became a Pulitzer Prize winning uh, journalist and remained uh, close to Bill, uh, but doesn't uh, know anything about uh, Polanyi. I said he met Polanyi one time at a dinner party at Bill's, but uh, he didn't really know anything about Polanyi. And he doesn't know that much about uh, philosophy and theology, but he's a very interesting guy to talk to, although he does tell tales from uh, what uh, 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 Richard says, who uh, lives how close to him? Uh, he's in the same retirement. In the same retirement community. Um, he said he hoped to have come to the conference. Oh, he very much wanted to come to the conference, yes, yes. And he sent me some more communications uh, this week with uh, recollections about Bill's teaching. Well, uh, then in... Uh, 55, of course, uh, uh, Bill goes to Manchester, uh, and that's the t that's well documented in in the Scott Molesky volume. And I, you know, I, uh, we certainly relied a lot on that volume, but also uh, uh, Marty Molesky has records uh, beyond the volume, which he retrieved for us, and uh, notes that uh, are not referred to in the volume. And of course, there's the longer draft. Uh, it's about 1,200 pages that has more about some of this, this stuff. So there's more. I'm also saying if there's anybody here who wants to do more with this, there is, there is uh, more material <laughs> out there to work with. But uh, he, he goes uh, uh, and, and, he, and he receives this uh, copy of, of, of the, uh, what's going to be personal knowledge. Uh, and uh, at that time. Now, uh, one of the questions then is uh, soon after this, Bill goes to Austin. Uh, and we asked Rule uh, Tyson, and he didn't really have much to say about that. Uh, we see from a document that Dale and I saw yesterday that Bill had a, like a name chair uh, down there uh, at Austin. But there was a student movement, and there's some notes about that, uh, that uh, I think Yoder might have been kind of involved in creating this, although his uh, to-be wife uh, and other co-eds, as he said, were, uh, uh, were uh, in this, to, to make Bill Chancellor. And so this, well, this, is this is at UNC. So the question is, why did he leave UNC? He's just, you know, he's gotten tenure, he's associate professor. Uh, uh, but. Uh, we've also learned that there was a kind of a push in Episcopal theological education at that point to, to integrate uh, religion and culture uh, courses into the curriculum, so there was that kind of opening. But anyway, he leaves UNC, goes to Texas for three years. Um, in 55, I didn't mention, uh, Bill is 36 years old and Polanyi is 64, just to kind of keep, keep that in mind. That's helpful to think about. Um, well, while Bill is in Austin, uh, Polanyi shows up. There, that, uh, you may have heard Bill talk about that. It's uh, in, the, in the biography, but he shows up at his office at 8 o'clock in the morning, and Polanyi took a red-eye flight, and he's asleep uh, with his arms uh, on his umbrella. Uh, in, in Bill's office. The janitor let Polanyi in, and, and Polanyi got a little nap. Uh, well, uh, Polanyi had retired, and he was kind of taking the grand tour. He goes to Chicago and meets with Hayek, he, the Committee on Social Thought. He goes to Stanford and meets with... He goes to Austin, Texas, to the seminary to meet Poteet. Uh, we are not sure. I mean, th th this, is a, this is a developing relationship, clearly. Uh, but we have also found that he gave a lecture in Austin at that time. We, and it's in your dissertation, according to Phil, uh, but we don't know where the lecture was, uh, was given. There's just these notes in Gelwick's file of 
uh, the outline of the lecture, and it says Austin at that date. So we don't know if he gave the lecture at the university or at the seminary. But anyway, the, the relationship uh, is, is, is clearly developing. If he feels comfortable enough to get himself checked into Bill's office and go to sleep uh, before Bill is there. Um, so there's uh, uh, a, a warm personal relationship uh, uh, developing. Uh, okay, Bill goes back to Duke. Um, uh, in 60, to the Divinity School, uh, influence of Cushman, clearly. Uh, in 62, uh, Bill was at Oxford for a term. Uh, we have not yet found any proposals for that sabbatical, any report of it or letters. And Polanyi was stateside for a good bit of that uh, period. But they must have had some contact because Bill is even more enthusiastic about Polanyi when he comes back and he starts working on getting Polanyi to Duke. And he comes to Duke to give the Duke lectures uh, in 64. I think somewhere there's a note that Bill's time in Oxford was to spend time with I.T. Ramsey right. as much as with Polanyi. Right, right, right. I mean, and he, this, was, this was his period of high interest and use of uh, that philosophy. Uh, he, uh, he, he cites Ramsey and talks about personal uh, uh, conversation with him uh, in, in uh, some of his essays. And Ramsey is a contributor to your collection. Yes, yes, to, what? to uh, intellect and hope, uh, which is uh, which is coming up here quickly. So now um, these lectures at Duke uh, were were very significant, and um, I think for the relationship, it was a time of of uh, intellectual exchange. Were any of you there at uh, Duke at that time? Okay, did. And uh, so uh, uh, there's this, I, and in the, in the longer document, uh, I have uh, the longer account from, from Scott's interview with Poteet of uh, why they were significant, the way they were set up. Polanyi would give a lecture, they would distribute the notes from the previous lecture, they would have everyone come together to talk informally uh, the next day after the lecture. Uh, it was a, t a time that Polanyi got more uh, feedback from people across uh, disciplines and more serious uh, attention to his thought. And during this year, Polanyi went around. He went down to uh, Tougaloo to see Elizabeth uh, Sewell. He, uh, he gave lectures in Greensboro and Chapel Hill, and uh, he worked on some lectures that were published later that he gave in Jerusalem. He, I think, went to MIT. So he, Polanyi was, was very active in this period, uh, but uh, it's uh, clear that they were thinking about some of the same uh, topics, and uh, we think there's a good chance there was some significant exchange and possible mutual uh, influences during that time. Uh, after those lectures, uh, and this is when the, all the debates about uh, whether the test, whether the Terry lectures should be published in the form that they should, Bill tells him uh, the Terry lectures were given at Yale, but both Marjorie Green and Bill tell Polanyi, no, you don't want to do that. Uh, Bill was really angling to get the Duke lectures published. They, uh, they almost had the deal done, and then the Yale lawyers came in. Some of this is in the uh, Scott Molesky, but I'm saying Bill is involved in you know, in, in, in the publication of Polanyi's stuff, in editing the stuff at that point. Uh, 65 is the first of the conferences at Bowdoin College, uh, and 66 was the second. At the first conference, Bill chaired the session on physics and reality, and uh, Wigner gave the main paper. At the second conference, Bill gave a major paper. We found references to all of this in uh, some of the correspondence uh, from uh, Marjorie Green and others. Th those conferences are uh, fascinating in and of themselves beyond Polanyi and Poteet. Uh, many of the major players in the last quarter of the 20th century were gathered there. We're talking about 
uh, McIntyre, Taylor, uh, Poteet, Polanyi, Green. And then after that conference, Marjorie got a grant, $250,000 from the Ford Foundation, that to set up kind of study groups on Polanyi across the world. Uh, and there were 10 or 12 of these at various universities and other locations. Uh, and uh, Phil and I had an opportunity a couple of weeks ago to interview a guy named George Gale, who was the graduate student who Marjorie hired to, uh, to be the business manager and the, the overall coordinator. And he did a lot of editing of Knowing and Being and other documents. Uh, he, he did this for five years, and he has uh, fascinating tales about uh, Marjorie Green and uh, uh, Polanyi and, uh, and uh, John Silber and McIntyre. I'll, I'll tell you some of this uh, stuff later if there's time. And that's my, our current hypothesis is something happens with Bill, and he decides he doesn't want to put the time into that. These were conferences basically a, to combat uh, reductionism and positivism in various disciplines uh, across the world. And the people who participated in these are even more impressive. I mean, Nobel winners, uh, it goes on and on, the, 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 uh, the people who participated in those. Um, was McCoy in any of those conferences? I'm not aware that he was. Yeah. And I think uh, Phil would have pointed that out because, of course, Phil is one of McCoy's students. Uh, uh, well, I, okay, so there's this publication work, these conferences at, uh, at Bowdoin. Intellect and Hope is in this same period, and many of the people from Bowdoin were the contributors to, contributors to Intellect and Hope. Um, uh, Bill's involvement in Intellect and Hope, it is, it is clear uh, I mean, it was Langford and Poteet edited it, but I think Bill did a lot of the editing. At least this is what he tells uh, uh, Provost Cole and, uh, and President Knight as he's describing his, uh, in some cases, weekly correspondence with uh, the people writing those essays. Um, since a number of you did not read these, I, I think I should just read a couple of sections to give you a sense of how enthusiastic Bill at this point was about what I'm calling Polanyi's grand project. And this is sort of setting it up for the, the turn that we're going to see here quickly. I didn't tell my, turn my watch on. How am I doing here? Uh, let's see. I've got about uh, 10 more minutes. Okay. Um, <clears throat> To offset the lack of consultation, I've been in continuous correspondence with our authors, supplying them in some cases weekly with unpublished current works of Polanyi, sometimes specifying in exhaustive detail precisely what we wanted, in many cases passing on finished essays by other authors. So this is Bill kind of reporting to Provost Cole about what he was doing. If I may be forgiven for saying so, it is the most comprehensive and integral assault upon behaviorism and reductionism of which I know save only that of Polanyi's work itself. And it has the additional advantage of coming from prestigious hands in many different fields. Authors from the fields of religion, philosophy, political science, biology, physics, Northern Ireland, England, Belgium, and so forth. Uh, that's Bill describing intellect and hope. Uh, he says to uh, President Knight, uh, I think the enclosed carbon is self-explanatory. I'm suffering from delusions of grandeur. Uh, even so, it has become true that the largely reductionistic ethos of modernity is losing its grip, thank God, with Sig Koch having struck at some painful blows while on our faculty in Polanyi. He's another guy who's involved in all this, probably the source of the money, because uh, he went to Rockefeller from Duke. Uh, and Polanyi, in 64, having on paper at least, Administers the, administered the coup de grace. So um, the result uh, is intellect and hope. For good or ill, the name of Polanyi and his work is coming to be associated with that of Duke all over the world, rather as that of Husserl with Louvain. That's Bill writing, the pres writing President Knight. 
So uh, what I'm saying, uh, and I'm going to make a sort of more bold uh, statement than I ultimately probably want now. Okay. Um, Sixty-eight. Well, in this period, Petit is right in there pitching with Polanyi. All right, but in sixty-eight, there's a radical change. There's the classic letter which we have in here uh, when he pulls out of being the, the co-editor of Polanyi's collected papers, where he writes Marjorie Green and says, "I made a mistake when I told uh, Michael in Washington I could do this. I can't do it." And it's partly because of us, his students. And I can tell you, having read, in the, since writing this, the correspondence uh, between Green and Polanyi about that book, that if Bill had been involved in that, there'd be a lot of dissertations that never would have been finished because there was an awful lot of work uh, in, uh, involved and a, and a lot of hassling. And Marjorie is amazing the way she tells him, you shouldn't put this in there. You're wrong about this and that. You need to change this and that. Uh, but uh, that's Polanyi and, and, Mar and Marjorie Green. So he pulls out of that. He doesn't do the study groups. Uh, and we don't know that he was invited, but we think he probably would have been. Uh, he goes to Greece. And that fall in 68, he has the Orphic dismemberment when he walks around uh, the corner in the evening light and sees the uh, sculpture. Uh, so uh, I think from 64, to, particularly from 64 to 67, Petit was Polanyi's ally, promoter, agent, designated literary executor, probably. Highly enthusiastic about the big project. But what he realizes is that Paul, both he and Polanyi have been trying to deal with the Enlightenment on terms that the Enlightenment had set, and he's got to go deeper, and that's what he begins to do. Now, he doesn't drop Polanyi. The deep personal friendship re remains. He goes to Texas really as a kind of a caregiver at that point, uh, comes back saying, I had to serve as Polanyi's uh, memory. It's it's beginning to show by this point that, that Polanyi, and Polanyi is aware of it when you read the letters. Oh, it is, it's, it's, it's so uh, sad to read um, that Polanyi's losing some of his uh, cognitive edge. Uh, but he, Bill doesn't participate. Uh, he, he doesn't take on meaning, though he was asked to. Uh, that, that's the last book by uh, Polanyi. He does read the outline. There's talk about Polanyi coming to Duke. There's talk about maybe Bill going over there to help. Uh, there's a whole string of people that Polanyi tried to get to help him write meaning and uh, eventually got Proche. But uh, Bill uh, can... Bill agreed to at one point and then he had to back off, or chose to back off. Chose to back off. Did he respond to the outline? We don't know. Uh, we don't know, yeah. Uh, and, and there, I mean, the, the information be out, may be out there somewhere, but we, mm -hmm. we, we don't know at this point. Uh, so Bill continues to explore other alternatives to finding a post-critical position uh, that's sufficiently radical. He continues his heavy teaching and advising schedule. He becomes department chair. And then the post-critical path back to recovering the ground becomes even clearer to him uh, spring of 76 when he writes the note for the graduate seminar, which some of you were probably in, uh, which, you know, turns into a longer note and then turns into Polanyan meditations. So I think 1968 was a key year in this reorientation away from Polanyi's grand program as Polanyi was pursuing it and the new direction that still draws from, but now goes for a phenomenological fleshing out of the underlying logic of Polanyi and more critical of many of Polanyi's explicit arguments. It's his Orphic dismemberment. And by the way, uh, there is more in the letters about what the Orphic um, dismemberment was about, letters that he wrote to Dale and Ben and others uh, during that, that period, uh, and sort of bibliographical citations. Uh, uh, so that's something we, uh, we want to learn more about. Well, uh, I've gone too long, but um, as I say, uh, 
I didn't know how intimately he had been aligned with Polanyi earlier. And, and all of this leads me to wonder if uh, those of you who studied with, Polanyi, studied with Bill earlier got the same Polanyi that uh, we got in uh, 68 to 7, and uh, those after 76 got the same Polanyi. Uh, and did we, more importantly, did we get the same Poteet? Um, well, by 71, uh, as we know, uh, he saw how Polanyi's mental powers were, uh, were slipping when he was in Texas. And then when you read the uh, biography, you get some sense of the struggle of those last years. But when you read the letters, it's, it's even sadder. Polanyi continues to hope that Bill and others could help him, but it got more and more difficult. Marjorie tells Michael point blank that parts of meaning are a, quote, betrayal of personal knowledge, <laughs> she says. You, uh, you're losing it. Uh, it was true. It was true, and I swear, I, don't know, I do not think she, uh, I, I, I wonder whether she realized that. Um, Richard uh, Gelwick's reports of Polanyi's confusion are poignant reminders of what is in some of our futures. But uh, Magda still, uh, <laughs> Magda still trusted Bill over others who were trying to help or who were trying to help themselves to the uh, papers at their institution. But it, it's, it really is uh, sad, but here we are 40, 40 years later still carrying on, so all is not lost, and I'll shut mm -hmm. up. So. It's a loss of